Good morning, and thank you for joining the Tetra Tech earnings call. As a reminder, Tetra Tech is also simulcasting the presentation with slides in the investor section of its website at tetratech.com. This call is being recorded at the request of Tetra Tech, and this broadcast is the copyrighted property of Tetra Tech. Any rebroadcast of this information in whole or part without the prior written permission of Tetra Tech is prohibited. With us today for management are Dan Batrack, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Steve Burdick, Chief Financial Officer, Leslie Shoemaker, Chief Innovation Officer, and Joseph Fong, High Performance Buildings Global Lead. They will provide a brief overview of the results and will then open the call for questions. I would like to direct your attention to the Safe Harbor Statement in today's presentation. Today's discussion contains forward-looking statements about future business and financial expectations. Actual results may differ significantly from those projected in today's forward-looking statements due to the various risks and uncertainties, including the risks described in Tetra Tech's periodic reports filed with the SEC. Except, as required by law, Tetra Tech undertakes no obligations to update its forward-looking statements. In addition, since management will be presenting some non-GAAP financial measures as references, the appropriate GAAP financial reconciliations are posted in the investor section of Tetra Tech's website. At this time, I would like to inform you that all participants are in a listen-only mode. At the request of the company, we will open up the conference for questions and answers after the presentation. With that, I would now like to turn the call over to Dan Batrack. Please go ahead, Mr. Batrack. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Latonia. And uh, good morning, and welcome to our third quarter's uh, fiscal year 2024's earnings conference call. Uh, I'd like to start off with uh, thanking everyone who attended our investor day that took place uh, just a little over two months ago in New York City. Now, at the event, we set out our vision and our goals for our fiscal year 2030, which focused on our high end consulting in water, environment, and sustainable infrastructure. I'm pleased to report that Tetra Tech continued our strong performance through the third quarter of this fiscal year 2024, delivering both record quarterly revenue and an all-time high backlog of well over $5 billion for the first time in the company's history. Through our focus on front-end advisory and consulting work, we continued to expand our margins, with this quarter delivering a 13.3% EBITDA margin, up 120 basis points from last year. Due to our strong performance and visibility, I'm pleased to say that we've been able to raise our full year guidance uh, for fiscal year 2024, and I'll provide the details of that on our updated guidance slide here in just a few moments. Uh, during today's call, I'm going to begin this call with an overview of our third quarter and outlook for the remainder of the fiscal year. Uh, Steve Burdick, our Chief Financial Officer, will provide an overview of our financial performance. We'll cover our capital allocation, and I'm pleased to say he will discuss the scheduled stock split and some of the details associated with that item. Uh, Dr. Leslie Shoemaker, our Chief Innovation Officer, will provide an update on our global water markets. And I'm really pleased today to have Joseph Long with us, our High Performance uh, Buildings Lead, who's going to provide insight into some of the newest approaches that we have in that market, which include cooling of high performance data centers and uh, chip fab um, uh, building systems. For the third quarter, we had a very strong third quarter this year. Our net revenue increased 12% to $1.11 billion in the quarter, setting a new record for any quarter in the company's history for revenue. Our EBITDA increased 32% to $129 million in the quarter, which has almost tripled the rate of our net revenue growth, directly in line with our goal to increase margins more rapidly and our revenue growth. And finally, in the quarter, we generated an all-time high uh, for the third quarter earnings per share of $1.59, up 42% from the prior year. I'd now like to present our performance by our reporting segments. In the third quarter, our government services group, or the GSG segment, is up 25% compared to last year to a total amount of $488 million. And the segment generated a strong 14.6% margin, up 60 basis points from the prior year. The key driver for GSC's margin expansion was an increase in higher margin environmental 
in advanced water treatment work. The Commercial International Group, or our CIG segment, grew net revenue by 4% year over year and delivered a 13.9% margin, up an impressive 230 basis points from last year. Now that 230 basis points uh, increase, about half of that increase in the CIG margin was driven by an increase in the RPS margins and the work that they perform from our international operations. The RPS uh, activities have now reached an 11% uh, margin uh, for our third quarter of this year, which is up 400 basis points from last year's 7% margin that we had in the third quarter of fiscal year 2023. Uh, the other half of CIG's margin expansion was driven by strong performance in our international operations, especially associated with our front-end consulting environmental work uh, and renewable energy projects that we have in all of our international locations. I'd now like to provide an overview of our performance by our end customer. The work for our U.S. federal clients was up 34% from the same quarter last year, driven by increases of work that we do for USAID, our civilian and defense environmental programs. Without including the extraordinary work that we performed in Ukraine in the quarter, our federal revenues grew at an underlying 18% year-over-year rate. For state and local, if you exclude our disaster response work, our state and local revenues grew at an 8% rate, continuing to be driven by the work that we do in advanced water treatment for cities and utilities all across the United States. Our U.S. commercial net revenues were up 7% year-over-year, driven by renewable energy programs and environmental remediation services. And finally, our international revenue now represents about 40% of the company. And those revenues grew at a 5% rate during the quarter. As we've presented before on this call, we've been focusing on margin expansions in the RPS operations that joined us uh, here just about a year and a half ago. Uh, we've been very focused on reducing select programs that have become commodity and represent low or no margins within RPS. So this changing of the portfolio has been resulted in RPS's international revenues remaining relatively flat year over year. So if you exclude the RPS's international operations, which we are by purpose and objective uh, reshaping, the remainder of our international revenues actually grew at nearly a 10% rate year over year. I'd now like to discuss our backlog, which increased to an all-time high of $5.23 billion, up 19% year-over-year, and grew more than 10% sequentially. We received over $2 billion in orders during the third quarter alone, which represented a book-to-bill of 1.4, one of the highest rates that we've seen in uh, some time here at Tetra Tech. I'd also like to note that Tetra Tech only reports backlog on orders that are contracted, funded, and authorized for us to proceed uh, to doing the work. So this does not include any unfunded orders, which is a completely different method and much more conservative than you'll see reported anywhere in the industry. Uh, this quarter's orders included first-of-a-kind projects in PFAS, which we press released uh, here just recently, this last week, large-scale programs for advanced water treatment, and major initiatives to address climate mitigation and adaptation worldwide. At this point, I'd now like to turn the presentation over to our Chief Financial Officer, Steve Burdick, to present the details of our financials. So, Steve? Hey, uh, thank you, Dan. So, I'd like to now provide an update on the results for year-to-date performance, as well as our working capital, cash flow, and capital allocation through the third quarter. So, net revenues increased by 18% to over $3 billion year-to-date, driven by strong end markets across all the geographies. Our EBITDA and operating income increased at a higher rate than our top-line revenue growth. As Dan discussed earlier in the call, we continue to focus on the front-end consulting work for water and environment, which are carrying higher margins across all of our end markets. And as such, EBITDA came in at $414 million, or up 41% year-over-year. And the EBITDA margins improved 200 basis points year-over-year. Our operating income increased 43%, to $357 million and margin 
margins improved 190 basis points year over year. These margin increases were primarily driven by improvements in operations across both our GSG and CIG markets. And in CIG, as Dan discussed, we are seeing the successful results of our efforts related to the RPS acquisition from optimizing RPS's portfolio of projects and better mix overall. Year to date, our EPS of $4.40 increased compared to last year. And if you recall, last year included an FX hedge gain of about $1.23. So excluding this one-time FX hedge gain, EPS grew at 53% year over year. I would like to now provide an update on our working capital and our cash flow for the third quarter. So cash flows generated from operations for the third quarter were $141 million and exceeded net income by over 64%. The trailing 12 months totaled $376 million, which was up 23% from the previous trailing 12 month period. Now, over the last 12 months, cash flows exceeded net income by more than 100%. And we, and when uh, you know we look back over the last our you know, historical financial results, we noted that cash flow from operations has exceeded net income every fiscal year for the last two decades. Our focus on working capital and cash flows has resulted in our DSO reflecting an industry-leading standard of 54 days versus the industry average of about 80 days. The third quarter results saw an improvement of four days from last year, and this historical low DSO for working capital is sustainable over the long term as we continue to make cash flows from operations a priority. Um, the slower DSO metric also provides significant insight into our core business as it reflects the outstanding work that our project managers lead relative to higher quality projects and highly satisfied clients in our broad portfolio across all of our end markets and geographies. And our net debt amounts to $650 million. And the net debt on EBITDA was at a leverage of 1.15 times, well below a year ago, which was at 1.73 times. Furthermore, our current leverage is about half the leverage bolt-to-bolt at the time we acquired RPS, as it was about 2.3 times in January of 2023. I would like to now present our capital allocation overview as of the third quarter of fiscal 2024. We have a significant amount of liquidity available to invest in organic and acquisitive priorities. This balance between fixed rate and variable rate debt helps to mitigate interest rate risk as we look to invest in key strategic areas. This current mix of debt exposure has resulted in a weighted average interest cost of borrowing at less than 4%, which is 30% lower than the current Fed borrowing rates. We have a strong pipeline for acquisitions, which is aligned towards technology innovations, especially in water and environmental spaces where we have led the markets. Regarding our dividend program, I want to announce that our board of directors approved a 29 cent quarterly dividend which is a 12% increase year over year. This is our 41st consecutive quarterly dividend, and our dividends have increased by double digits every year since we initiated these payments. As we revised our capital structure in the last year to take advantage of the credit markets to support our financing needs, I wanna remind our shareholders that we do have available a significant portion of the 400 million from the stock buyback plan approved by our board of directors as part of our discipline capital allocation strategy. And, you know, as we've continued to generate record financial results, our stock price has increased significantly over the last 10 years. I want to announce Tetra Tech's five for one stock split that was approved by our board of directors. The impetus for this decision was very much based on the input we received this year from both analysts and our investors. The primary benefit for our shareholders is that we want to increase liquidity and lower trading costs for institutional and retail investors and our employees who will benefit from the stock split. The stock split will be effective at, after the close of trading on September 6th. Thus, this five for one adjusted trading will begin when the market opens on September 9th. And you can find additional details in our press release. Finally, we will provide to investors and analysts, the financial disclosures related to 
the share count where we will recast all historical information in our next form 10k so i'm uh, i'm very pleased to share these really strong results through the third quarter of 2024 I want to thank you all for your support and i will now hand the call over to leslie and joseph to discuss our leading global water business thank you steve Two of the areas that we discussed during our investor day were our significantly expanded opportunities for water-related services in the United Kingdom and the new requirements for PFAS water treatment in the United States. Most recently in the United Kingdom, we have a newly elected labor government, which has actually re-emphasized the importance of their water quality management in rivers, flood management, and water supply protection. These priorities and the associated aggressive goals that have been set for the new AMP 8 cycle, which is just beginning, directly align with our technically differentiated expertise and industry-leading software solutions, such as real-time control, uh, spill management using Seasoft, flood risk management using our Fusion Map platform, and advanced leak detection solutions using our WaterNet system. In the U.S., Similarly, the recently really released National Needs Service uh, Survey reinforces increased concerns regarding water quality protection and advanced water treatment, again, directly in line with what we do. Today, we're seeing our municipal clients begin to include PFAS treatment in updates and expansion of their water treatment facilities, which is a good indication of the integration of PFAS into long-range planning across our more than 500 municipal clients. And in California, uh, they have just passed on the ballot a new $10 billion bond measure that would commit funding directly aligned with our expertise in water quality, advanced water treatment, and watershed programs. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Joseph Fong to discuss more of our water-related opportunities in high-performance buildings. Joseph? Thank you, Leslie. Tetratech's market-leading advanced water treatment expertise has become a key competitive advantage in two of our high-performance buildings' fastest growth markets, advanced manufacturing fabrication and high-tech data centers. As we shared during our investor day in May, the U.S.'s investment to boost chip production incentivized manufacturers to commit over $200 billion for fabrication manufacturing facilities, in addition to requiring high-performing, energy-efficient building systems, these fabrication facilities also require the production of ultra-pure water that is essential for the ultra-clean processing of the silicon wafers used to create computer chips. We are seeing increasing demand for advanced water treatment solutions as chip manufacturers initiate expanding their ultra-advanced water processing capacity for new and upgraded facilities, and municipalities invest in augmenting water supplies and pretreatment to attract fab facilities into their jurisdiction. Today's AI servers require more computing power and generate much more heat than their predecessors. Tetratech is working with our high-tech data center clients to implement advanced liquid cooling solutions, such as immersion liquid cooling and direct-to-chip cooling. Tetratech's expertise in water chemistry and hydraulics is essential to designing liquid cooling systems, which can capture up to 80% of the total heat production. With over $500 billion in future investment forecasted in new computing infrastructure, including a 50% increase of current global data center capacity by 2029, we expect the design of high-efficiency cooling solutions to be a significant growth market for us. I would now like to turn the presentation back to Dave and Batrack. Thank you very much, Joseph. I'd now like to present our guidance for the fourth quarter and our updated guidance for all of fiscal year 2024. Uh, our guidance is as follows. For the fourth quarter, our range, our guidance for the range of net revenue is a range of 1.09 billion to 1.14 billion with an associated diluted earnings per share with a range of $1.82 to $1.87. For the entire fiscal year of 2024, our increased guidance is for a revenue range of $4.27 billion 
to 4.32 billion. Uh, the midpoint of that range would actually represent or does represent a 15% increase in our net revenue from what we realized in fiscal year 2023. Our updated earnings per share uh, guidance range is for a total of $6.23 to an upper end of $6.28 or a five cent range. Uh, the midpoint of that range represents a 23% increase in our earnings per share from what we realized in fiscal year 2023. Uh, a few assumptions, if you're following along on the webcast, you can see uh, these are based on uh, pre-stock split uh, numbers, which represents our 54 million uh, shares outstanding. Uh, it does include uh, intangible amortization, which is approximately 67 cents per share. Uh, we do assume in the fourth quarter, we will have approximately a 27% tax rate. And as in past presentations, this does exclude any contributions of revenue or income that may be realized from acquisitions that we would complete between now and the end of the fiscal year. In summary, this morning, uh, we see strong demand for our differentiated leading with science services all across the water and environmental markets that we work in. Our third quarter results set new all-time records for revenue, net revenue, backlog, and as Steve indicated, our day sales outstanding or our cash generation. And we set third quarter record results for operating income, EBITDA, and earnings per share. Our strategic focus on high-end water and environmental consulting is driving margin expansions very much in line with our longer-term goals that we presented in our investor day here back in May. As a result of our strong performance and confidence in our outlook, I'm pleased that we were able to raise our guidance for fiscal year 2024 for both net revenue and earnings per share. We're looking forward to implementing our stock split, as uh, Steve indicated a few moments ago, effective uh, after market close on September 6th in 2024 to provide even broader access to Tetradex stock for all of our investors. And with that, uh, Latanya, uh, we'd like to open the call up for questions. Thank you. The question and answer session will begin now. Please be aware that there will be a 30-second pause in our webcast to allow for buffering. At this time, audio participants are invited to submit their questions. Please remember to mute the audio function on your computer before you speak. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing any numbers. If you would like to ask a question, press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Our first question comes from Tim Mulroney with William Blair. Please proceed. Yes, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, I, I, I mean, your, your backlog is, is really healthy right now, up about 20% year over year. It's the first thing that caught my eye on your release, and I'm just curious how investors, how you think investors should interpret this in terms of your visibility for hitting that annual organic growth target of six to ten percent as you, you know, head into the in, into the fourth quarter and, and into next year. Well, that's a really good. That's a that's a great question. Uh, if I have uh, any commentary with respect to details on that increase. I know that we're up 19% in the quarter, year over year. I will say that some of that, I think, was timing, that I anticipated some of the orders would have come in in our second quarter. So I will say there's a little bit of catch-up included. So one thing I would uh, caution our investors is not to interpret that the backlog growth is going to directly translate into our net revenue growth. Uh, you do see the 6 to 10% ranges between double to triple uh, the level of our six to ten percent. Uh, I would say that uh, we did have one extraordinary area. One question I know we've had internally, and certainly when I saw the numbers, is uh, as very much at the high end or above what we would expect. We did have some extraordinary contributions of uh, orders that went into backlog from Ukraine, but I don't want there to be a misunderstanding that Ukraine was the majority of the contribution through USAID it uh, represented about a third of that increase. So of the 19%, about 6% six, uh, 6% of that, or about $160 million would have been extraordinary uh, in the quarter. Uh, so we still are well over double digit uh, year over year 
which is above what we anticipate our organic growth rates uh, we've been targeting at this time. So it should give us great visibility, of course, coming into the fourth quarter, but really all the way uh, in through 2025. Okay, that's that's helpful color. Um, I, uh, I, I want to switch gears really, really quickly to a regulatory conversation because it represents a preponderance of uh, questions that we've been getting from investors lately and was hoping you could comment on on this. We, we heard that there are you know, certain environmental regulations that may be, may be more susceptible to being overturned now that Chevron deference is gone. Are there areas of your business that you think are exposed or susceptible to changes in regulation as a as a result of this ruling? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, it certainly was uh, uh, gave a heightened sense of uh, analysis and evaluation. What is what does the uh, the Chevron doctrine or the Chevron uh, deference uh, mean to our business? And uh, we actually dove into it quite deeply over the past uh, couple months since the Supreme Court's uh, ruling on this has uh, come out. And we actually try to simplify it in three different ways. First of all, most of the work that we do uh, for environmental compliance activities is actually regulated at the state and local level. So it's state regulations, it's regulations by local counties and cities, and it's actually not driven by federal uh, regulation interpretation. So it only has a very small um, uh, intersection or nexus with respect to the work we actually do. Uh, second of all, the largest programs that we have are for the U.S. federal government. So it would be like the Department of Defense work that we do or work that we do for the Army Corps of Engineers. And it's not the practice of the U.S. federal government to contest regulatory determinations and take it to court. So the U.S. federal government doesn't sue themselves and go to court over this. So the uh, the items that are determined or agreed to with the regulators at the federal level, which might be the Environmental Protection Agency or some of these others, actually are just straight implemented. So we see that as essentially not uh, applicable or doesn't really impact it. And the last item we saw, and this is, it sounds a little uh, contrarian to the underlying, I guess, presumption is that if the uh, Chevron Doctrine is going to cause some uncertainty and in regulatory interpretation is bad for your business, I don't know on the commercial side if you're going to be uh, if you're going to go uh, contest the regulator's interpretation and go to a court, you better be clear. You better be compelling. Yes, you may need some attorneys. Yes, you need people who can uh, argue it, argue the positions, and support uh, the basis of your uh, your arguments. But all of it has to be based on data. It's not just an opinion. It has to be based on data, data analytics. And actually, if you want to take it and boil it down to its essence, you actually have to lead with science. You actually have to bring in a technical, well-positioned, a scientific uh, basis. And you know, there is a firm out there that the tagline is lead with science. And so that may actually <laughs> vote very well. Yeah, vote very well for TetraTech with respect to who you want to bring in to support your interpretations to the courts. So I actually see if this thing does um, have any un legs to it with respect to where there may be something contested by some of the large commercial clients. It actually could begin uh, presenting new opportunities that didn't exist for us before. So in, in some ways, it's actually maybe indirectly be good for our business. Understood. Very clear. Thanks, Dan. Hey, thank you very much, Dan. The next question comes from Sangeeta Jane with KeyBank Capital Markets. Please proceed. Yeah, thank you so much for taking my questions. Um, so if I can ask one on the revenue that you may be getting currently from the high-performance buildings and data centers, if you've broken that out, and also how much faster is that slice growing compared to the rest of your CIG segment? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And uh, we had Joseph Hong actually present those specific details uh, uh, in earlier meetings we've had. So, Joseph? Yes, thank you for that question. As shared during our investor day in May, we did share kind of the breakdown of those uh, numbers in terms of our revenue and how our advanced manufacturing fabrication and our data centers revenue um, as part of our high performance building total revenue. We had shared that uh, this year we are tracking towards a $100 million uh, revenue target for those two 
uh, sectors, and we are expecting a 20% uh, CAGR uh, for that market. So right now we are again trending towards $100 million between those two markets. Got it. That's helpful. And if I can ask one on M&A, um, as you pointed out, your leverage is trending towards the low end of your target range. And we just talked about rising uncertainty of policy outcomes in the U.S. Would that make you consider shifting more of your revenue base overseas as you look at M&A? You know, that's a, it's a good question. And I would say uh, no. I would say that uh, the, the world's largest economy is right here in the United States. Uh, the dollars set aside for uh, environmental stewardship, for clean water, uh, even new, even compliance with new regulations, things like PFAS, are measured in multiples of what they exist in other locations. Now, I do think the uh, technology is one area we're very focused on. Steve had mentioned that in his comments with respect to priorities for our uh, acquisitions or looking for people to join us. And the one thing that uh, that provides us or allows us is the uh, transfer of what we would, let's say we acquire it here in the U.S., or if it came through Canada, Australia, or the United Kingdom, it's actually transferable across all of our platforms to all of our clients. And it uh, gives, gives us a technical differentiation or competitive advantage to move it across all of our operations and our more than 550 offices in the company. So we're going to find the best technology. We're going to find the best uh, uh, new innovations that exist anywhere in the world. It could be uh, in the U.S. or elsewhere. But uh, as far as taking a precedent and moving uh, because of potential elections or potential uh, changes in the legal systems, uh, that is not buying us out, biasing us outside the U.S. Uh, this is still the largest market in the world, and we have a top position in each of these uh, markets that we're focused on whether it's water, environmental, uh, climate change, coastal protection, flood protection. Uh, we're in first place, and the only thing we're focused on is distancing ourselves even more in those areas. All right. Thanks so much, Dan. Yeah, thanks, thank you, Dan. The next question comes from Sabahat Khan with RBC. Please proceed. Great. Thanks, and uh, good afternoon. Um, I guess just Broadly, you know, you're taking up your guidance for this year, a few moving pieces in the backdrop. You know, I guess, how would you characterize 2024 within the context of kind of your overall guidance? So you obviously have the fiscal 23 numbers out there. You know, over the next at least two, three years, should we expect some elevated trends like we've seen this year on the top line and margins? Or you know, just trying to think about the cadence over the next two to three years of how kind of the numbers evolve and some of the funding from these larger U.S. bills flows through. Thank you. Yeah, good questions, uh, Saba. I'm glad you talked about sort of a longer trend. Uh, we're pretty clear, and uh, Steve uh, had presented, and I don't want to overly continue to reference the Investor Day, but the cornerstone or the uh, underpinning of Investor Day is 2030. And uh, Steve indicated uh, in great detail, uh, it's an organic growth rates between uh, 6 and 10%. And so what well, you'd ask, what's it look like over the next two or three years? I'll say what's it going to look like over the next five years and say it's going to be between 6 and 10% organic uh, growth rate. Now, it happens to be, you know, we were slightly over that this uh, this quarter, third quarter, but I would say not not drastically so. So it's nice if you're going to be outside that range that you're on the top end, which uh, we have been uh, for some time. But I would say over this uh, next several year period, we think that's about, about right. And then with respect to... Um, uh, acquisitions or having people come join us. And then we talked about a uh, I think, you know, wide range of uh, five to 10%. I think for modeling purposes, we've used four or five. And I think we've been well within uh, with that. It seems quite achievable. So I think if you look on a longer trend, and I would uh, uh, append your two to three years to let's talk up to five years, I think we'll be within these uh, these ranges we just talked about. And of course, it's very hard to talk about growth rates without talking about margin, because uh, revenue without income contribution uh, is like a day without sunshine here. So we uh, we do think that if you wanted to just use a, uh, a general uh, uh, guide, about 50 basis points a year. We've been at that number of expanding our overall uh, EBITDA margins. We've been about that rate for the past several years, and we expect that to continue uh, on into the future. So uh, I don't really want to uh, provide 2025 details. Uh, we're only a little over 90 days or 
as our next investor call, we'll provide the final uh, tale of our performance for fiscal year 24, and we'll provide uh, fiscal year 25 for the next one year. But if you want to look a little bit broader, those uh, ranges I just provided should be pretty representative. Great. And then just, I guess, on the, on the M&A side, obviously, I think you provided some parameters around the discipline on the metrics. Can you maybe just talk a bit more about some of the more in focus areas where you might want to complement some expertise, whether it's regions, whether it's you know, specific markets within water that might be of interest over the next few years? Yeah, I'd say there's a couple that we're really focused on. I think in the United Kingdom, we're doing well, but we can do better with respect to uh, a presence supporting the AMP structure, uh, AMP programs, which is the asset management program for water utilities across all the United Kingdom. Uh, we've got some very large uh, cornerstone programs. Uh, I think we can get more. So I would say if we can add additional uh, capability and contract capacity, so we'd look for that in the UK. Uh, same would be true uh, in uh, Australia. So look for additional uh, acquisitions that would be around water, and I would call that mostly municipal water, or in the UK you'd call it water utilities. Uh, and then technology. I'll repeat what I uh, just said a few moments ago. Uh, we're really focused on how can we technically differentiate ourselves even more so in the market. And it's not so much exactly we're focused on peers or competitors, we're focusing on how we can deliver better value to our clients. We want to deliver higher, you know, higher delivery, faster response, lower price point, and have better outcomes from our clients than ever before. And we think that that can largely be contributed through technology. And so whether or not it's our digital water programs through remote monitoring and automation of water treatment plants, which uh, we do believe over the next decade or so, there's 150 thousand different water systems in the United States or water utilities, we think that eventually they're all going to go to remote monitoring and automation. And we're not even in the first inning on that. And we want to be the leader in the forefront for that. So how can we do that? For sure, we have it internal, but acquisitions and identifying those that can come in. And I'm glad to say that just this last quarter, since our last uh, investor call, we had Convergence join us. While it's just a handful of individuals, the intellectual property and the uh, technologies that they brought are really uh, quite significant. So uh, look for us to uh, to continue to add those uh, over the next uh, over the next year and beyond. Great. Thanks very much for the color. Yeah, thanks, Abbott. The next question comes from Andy Whitman with Baird. Please proceed. <clears throat> Great. Good morning. Thank you for taking my questions, guys. Um, I guess I just wanted to start out a little bit and asking about Ukraine. Um, maybe just for context, Dan, can you just talk about uh, what the Ukraine uh, uh, contribution was to this quarter? And then recognizing uh, that you did book $160 million, um, I, I just wanted to see, I mean, you, you would not put that in your backlog if you didn't have great visibility and the contract to do that, right? So, um, I'm just trying to see how much visibility you have there. Like by my calculations, you did somewhere between like 50 and 60 million this quarter. So does that mean that you've got like three and a half quarters of work with the $160 million or how should we think about that? Yeah, that, well, you've got the numbers about right. I'll, I'll help refine this a little for you. So in the third quarter, we did uh, about $60 million worth of net revenue. So it was a good quarter. Uh, it's an interesting coming in. And I think we spoke on last quarter's call that we expect at the second half of fiscal year 24. So this year we do about 100. So I think we're about 10 million above uh, for the quarter where we thought we would be. And interestingly enough, we were over the top of our guidance range for net revenue by about $10 million. So everything was very strong. It took us to the very high end of our own range and then Ukraine pushed it up even higher. So uh, uh, we did do about 160. It's a great, it's a great question on does that mean you have uh, a good portion? Well, we burned, we put 160 in, but we burned 60. <laughs> so you really would take a look at net on that. But if you take a look at our backlog slide and our uh, press release, you'll know uh, we, we uh, presented on the first line a $439 million new addition for work in Ukraine. That's a contract or contract capacity. It's a new program referred to as SPARC with USAID. It allows us to continue to the work that we have, and only a very small portion of that was actually uh, obligated that went into our backlog in Q3. 
So we've got more contract capacity. Uh, we have more orders. We actually finished with a higher uh, uh, order book uh, for Ukraine. And of course, the uh, reaffirmation of by the U.S. government uh, to stand behind and with uh, Ukraine does give us visibility with respect to, I would say, uh, the political will. Now, I know there's been a lot of questions. Some have uh, asked me if there is a change in administration, could that get turned off? And my comment is maybe if uh, everybody, you know, with one phone call, the conflict is over. Maybe may we all hope that, that becomes true. Um, I think it may actually allow additional uh, restoration work through USAID that we've never seen before. You can actually do more work when someone's not firing overhead than uh, you can while you're in a conflict uh, zone. So uh, we have contract capacity measured in several hundreds of millions of dollars and the uh, 439 as listed uh, uh, first in our backlog presentation slide and our press release isn't the only contract that we have there. We're much broader and some have asked, well, what if there is some disruption uh, regarding U.S. Uh, commitments to uh, move forward with the contracts in place. Uh, I will tell you there's a lot of countries lined up behind to actually want to help once restoration is started, and these are our clients, whether it's UK aid, whether it's the European Union, or whether it's the coalition that includes places like Australia, where we're one of the largest international development supporters. So this is not a singular question, and in fact, even the singular question actually may have significant upside in the event the conflict is actually resolved. So uh, those are the numbers we have with respect to going into the fourth quarter for contract capacity, uh, the 60 million. Uh, I will say we're still standing by our 100 million for the second half. So it's pretty easy to take 100 minus the 60 in Q3. And I think we'll do around 40 in Q uh, in Q4, but I'll give you more specifics uh, on the next call, how it actually uh, how it actually turned out. That's really helpful context, Dan. Thank you for that answer. I wanted to ask my follow-up question on uh, RPS. You made the comment that you've been running off some of the lower margin work. That was always part of the plan. You, you said that when you acquired it, but you, you've owned it for a year and a half here, still kind of running some of that off. I'm just wondering how long is that tail? How much more, I guess, I guess it would be contracted backlog or something that you have there that needs to be gone through um, before we you think that you can show the um, the underlying growth that you talked about there, you know, in the double digits for that international segment. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good question. Uh, you're right; it's been about five quarters right now, so just a little over a year since they joined us. Uh, as we've always indicated we want to shape uh, their their mix of business to be similar to Tetra Tech. Uh, we want to put high-end, technically differentiated in front of everything, less competition, higher margin, uh, completely in collaboration with uh, uh, the rest of the company. I think we've got another one or two quarters. I'm not going to go to the dollar amount, but I think we've got a, uh, one or two quarters left before we've got the, uh, what I call the commoditized or the lower no margin work. Uh, that also, funny enough, I've always found it ironic that if you get lower no margin, on some of this work, it typically carries the highest risk to. And to say this just seems like it uh, shouldn't go together, and we agree it shouldn't go with us. <laughs> and so uh, I think one or two quarters, I think you'll see us by probably pretty close to the end of the calendar year, uh, sort of the culling of the last small work that doesn't really belong in our portfolio should be finished, and then you'll see the contribution on international uh, come with RPS along with all the rest of our international operations. So I, I hope that timing is helpful. It is. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you very much, Andy. The next question comes from Ryan Connors with North Coast Research. Please proceed. Hey, thanks. Good morning. Um, first off, uh, you know, congrats on the stock split. I know those aren't generally in vogue, but uh, I, I wish more companies would, would follow your lead. I think it's very uh, positive. Um, wanted to come on the issue of kind of the margin outlook from a different slice, you know, Dan, you mentioned 50 basis points a year is kind of what you laid out in the 2030 um, kind of game plan there. But we look at the backlog and the composition of the backlog. You know, you did mention one third of it is the USAID work. And you've said in the past that that's, you know, tends toward the lower margin side of what you do. So is that in fact the case with that particular, uh, those particular jobs with USAID um, and any color you can kind of share on what, what the backlog composition would tell us about 
you know, kind of the margin trajectory in the next, you know, uh, relatively near term. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question and it's, uh, it's very insightful, uh, Ryan. Uh, let me make one comment about uh, our margin increase, uh, the 60 basis points for Q3. If we, if I, you're absolutely right that the work that we do for international development generally and USAID specifically uh, is almost all cost plus work. Uh, it's a pre-negotiated low margin. If you're taking low financial risk, you get a lower margin. So if we did not have any Ukraine work, and I would say that work, uh, not just not just Ukraine, but USAID uh, carries about a 7% margin. If you, if you took that from our portfolio, our, our uh, government services group, TSG, would have been up over 100 basis points, and we would have been uh, well into the uh, uh, upper um, 15% for the quarter. So, uh, so I, don't, I don't like to use the word way, but it is a lower margin when you do the calculation. Uh, let me clarify one item. The incremental contribution of the backlog was about a third of it, not it represents a third of our overall backlog. So let me just clarify that. I simply was uh, referring to how much was contributed in the quarter or the increase in the 500 million uh, uh, that we had uh, sequentially. Um, so I, I do think the rest of our business is growing even at uh, a higher margin um, expansion. And the 50 basis points is with uh, international development, whether it's US, Australia, or uh, UK uh, included in the business. Uh, we are not de-emphasizing that. Uh, we are big time supporters of our clients in all three uh, jurisdictions, and it is included in the margin expansion. Now, how, what's the margin uh, embedded in the backlog that we have overall, the $5.2 uh, billion? Uh, it's pretty close to representing that 50 basis points uh, expansion that we expect to see. So we're not expecting some new big win or a C-state change in the business that we're performing. It's actually embedded in the work that we're being awarded and funded through the orders that comprise our backlog. Got it. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, and then back on the Chevron issue, um, you know, I think you meant you make a really interesting point, Dan, kind of the counterintuitive point that it could actually be a tailwind uh, in some areas. And my question is, um, you know, how big is litigation support today for Tetra Tech? Um, and is that an area where, I mean, I would imagine – Yes, it's lead with science, but you know there there are nuanced differences to that type of business, and obviously the relationships are different. So, is that something where you feel how big is it today, and would you be staffed appropriately to, or would you have to move people, or, or could that actually be uh, an area of potential M um, and A uh, opportunity? And if in fact your your counterintuitive take on that, you know that it does create some additional business. Uh, another good question. This uh, this uh, actually has what I would call uh, you really have to understand the business to uh, parse that. So what it would look like at the most uh, surface level is, are you going to go support somebody litigating? What we would do is we would actually want to be the technical support for the data collection, the analysis, and the, uh, I'll call it, I'm trying not to use the word, uh, conclusion, because the courts may become the, the final arbiter on this, but the technical conclusion with respect to the presence, the movement, the fate, and the final recommendations or interpretation. With respect to when you talk about, or we talk about experts that are going to be supporting litigation, as soon as you word the, use the word L, litigation, generally it means uh, expert testimony in court on the stand, sometimes referred to as hired guns, even if they're technical, uh, you know, Dr. Smith, Dr. Jones, uh, and we try to stay out of that. There are people that are make their livings uh, being in-court litigators. We simply want to provide an objective, quantitative uh, measure that is technically supported by data analytics, science, the rest of it. Uh, we'll leave the expert testimony in the stand to others because what we've seen is every time you're in court, there's somebody on the other side of that. And we don't want to be actually providing a uh, opinion or an opine on what the data is. For us, the data is quantitative, it's objective, it's scientifically supported, and there are firms, and we certainly know many of them, that uh, actually have in-court hired guns testimony. And uh, don't look for us to try to turn our 
PhD experts in hydrology, water mechanics, chemistry, uh, remediation uh, into uh, in court. So I think that our people that we have within the company can support that work because that's the work we're doing for both our government, federal, state, local, commercial, and that data can be used whether or not it's used currently to support the work we're doing or some other person's uh, objective work. But I don't see that actually having uh, to change the, the under fabric of what we do as a company. Got it. And then I assume we're near the end of the queue. So if I could just sneak one more in, um, you know, you mentioned potential change of administration. I guess what we've learned since the last conference call is that there's going to be a change of administration one way or the other. Um, we've got a new candidate. Um, is, is there any daylight that you've, as you look at the Biden administration versus Harris kind of priorities, is there any do, difference, nuance differences there, the potential approach um, versus the current um, administration, or, or, or is it pretty much um, they're on the same page with most most things that relate to Tetra Tech? Yeah, it's uh, what 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 I've heard in the hallways here is a new voice, uh, same platform, <laughs> and or similar platform, and we've not seen any uh, any changes. I think that there uh, might be a little bit more emphasis on environmental justice and actually prioritizing areas that uh, might have been lower in the queue, which is actually good for us. That would put more work on orphan sites that uh, work for uh, would be done by EPA and others. And uh, that's certainly work that we do already. And we could see that actually seeing a plus up. I think they could see reprioritization and speeding up of uh, some Superfund uh, site activity uh, to get it done quicker to actually end it because many of these uh, uh, locations are in uh, underprivileged uh, locations across the country. So you could see some of that. But I would say that the uh, the fundamental platforms are, are very similar. I won't go so far as to say identical, but I think the general adage, uh, a different voice, same platform is a good way to look at it. Understood. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Ryan. The next question comes from Tate Sullivan with Maxim Group. Please proceed. Hi, thank you. Um, just a follow-up on the RPS and revenue growth. You said international revenue, excluding RPS, was 10% year over year. Was that what? What was the comment you specifically said about that? I think you said something in addition to running off some lower margin projects. But can you review that, please? Well, what I was saying is that the uh, uh, that the RPS component of our international uh, revenues has been relatively flat or same number, no growth. And so the growth rate on that would be, when I say flat, I guess I mean zero. And uh, and I think that uh, because what's happening is what we are adding work within the work. And, and I don't, I'm going to try and as we go forward, I'm trying quite a bit this year, we'll try even double down on it next year, not to use RPS as a different component of the company because they're as much part of Tetra Tech as, uh, as I or anybody else am. Uh, RPS is uh, doing a great job. They've got a number of individuals that are leading major divisions for Tetra Tech. Uh, they are technical leaders. They're financial leaders. Uh, they're just the, among the best that we have in the entire corporation. However, they are still in a transition. It's been five quarters since they've joined us. And we did indicate that we wanted to take some of the revenues that have been more commoditized or was carrying lower or lower margin or higher risk out of the business. So at the beginning, we actually saw in the first several quarters, revenues actually for RPS went down. So people had come in and I, I know I had our investor relationships, Jim Wu and others talk to uh, investors and analysts that, that we were going to uh, grow through subtraction. And so margins are going to go up, profits are going to go up, and we're going to actually do less work for it. Now, we've got to the point where it's not shrinking anymore, that the amount we're taking out of the business is roughly equal to the amount we're putting in, which so the amount is going down by 4 or 5% this last quarter, but we've added that amount of higher margin work. So what do you see? You see flat on revenues, but you see margins up by 400 basis points year over year. And I think that this, uh, this uh, phenomenon of it, taking out as much as you add, the taking out part is just one or two quarters away. And then you'll see RPS contributing not only on margin expansion, but also on revenue contribution internationally. So that uh, is, uh, is really the uh, dynamic that I'm referring to. And I, I, I hope that helps with um, 
making it a little clearer? Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Dave. The next question comes from Michael Dudas with Vertical Research Partners. Please proceed. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Michael. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Leslie mentioned in her prepared remarks about uh, a new water bond proposed, $10 billion in California. Um, uh, what's the history on success of those types of initiatives in the state? And when something like get, that gets passed, maybe in the historical levels or what you've been uh, involved with, how quickly that business can start to flow into uh, your, your consultant advisory work? Uh, good question. Uh, we've actually seen in the past they are relatively successful, uh, so I wouldn't want to predict what's going to happen in an election, but uh, uh, water quality and water programs have had a great track record of being approved. Uh, we actually had other measures that were related to water management and uh, stormwater that, that were passed in previous years and then were integrated uh, over probably a one to two year period. They get integrated into uh, the various local agencies and their implementation plans and funding. Uh, so that we would expect this one would run pretty much along that same cycle of uh, organization and planning and bidding in the first year and then actually uh, seeing it in uh, actual proposals in the second year. Oh, that's that's very helpful, Liz. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Michael. This will conclude the Q&A session. I will now turn the conference back over to Mr. Dan Patrat to conclude. Uh, thank you very much, Latanya, and uh, thank all of you for uh, attending the call today. I very much appreciate uh, uh, the questions that we had today, those that we received in, uh, in, uh, through investor relations and other uh, avenues that we can actually incorporate into our presentations. We really do want to be as transparent and forward thinking and communicative as possible. Uh, I look forward to speaking to you all again in our next quarterly call where we'll present the results of our fourth quarter and all of fiscal year 2024, which of course after three quarters is off to a really, really strong start. And, uh, and probably most importantly, to sharing with you our, our guidance and outlook for fiscal year 2025. And with that, I hope you have a great rest of your Thursday and a great rest of the week. Uh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our conference for today. Thank you all for participating and have a nice day. All parties may disconnect now.